Welcome back to the Spectre Creative Channel, where we talk about toys, because I love toys. I collect toys, and I've been fortunate enough to also get to make toys. My name is Scott Toy Guru Nightlick, and of the toys that I've made and collected, the majority tend to be in the action figure category. Although I've worked on dolls and wheel toys and even things that are basically giant paperweights. But outside of my professional career, I'm also an adult collector, probably like you if you're watching this video. And if you're not an adult collector, you should be one. Now, as adult collectors, we tend to look at all toys as made for us, but this is one of the biggest fallacies because the vast, vast, vast majority of toys are sold to children, or rather are sold to adults to give to children because children have no money. And if you're a toy company and you're making action figures, this is basically what you want to be making because that's where all the sales are going to come from. And toys that are out there that as adult collectors we look at and say, oh, hey, that's for me because I'm an adult collector. Well, the truth is, yes, you may be picking it up, but it really is dependent on kids buying it, number one. Because if it was depending on just collectors and was sold in the retail aisle, that's basically a recipe for disaster and you're going to get delisted and put on clearance. So, yes, we all have giant toy collections at home, and we all love them, but we are not the vast majority of audience and consumers of action figures. And even as kids get more into screens, hey, they still are. That doesn't mean there aren't action figures put out there just for adult collectors. Of course there are, or things like this wouldn't exist, because no child should really be playing with this, and if you've given this to a child, shame on you. And that's why there's alternate placement at retail, specifically those large walls behind electronics that Walmart and Target have. Well, Walmart isn't as big as Target's, but the point is this is where toys that are only dependent on adult collector sales can live because they don't have as high of a velocity requirement at retail to sell as many units per week as things that are skewed in the aisle. Okay, that was a bit of background. So... We've talked before about tooling, and this is a tool. It's like a giant mold, like when we used to play with Play-Doh as kids, except instead of being made of plastic and putting pl putting uh, Play-Doh inside, it's made of metal, and it's used to make a plastic toy. They're made by hand. They're etched by hand based on a sculpt that's provided of said toy. And it's a very expensive and, well, slightly complicated process because they have to be so durable. That's why they're made of giant pieces of steel. They're put inside of an injection molding machine, which takes up a whole room, and they have hot liquid plastic injected into them, hence tooling injection molding, because the plastic is shot into the mold, and it takes the shape when it cools of whatever the mold is. Now, most plastic that comes out of a tool is on what's called a sprue. A sprue you've probably seen if you have stick fuzz or any other toy where you have to kind of snap it off of what a lot of people also call plastic trees. Sometimes it, a full item will come out, but if the item has lots of parts, unlike something like a uh, Tupperware or a bowl that can just be shot out of an injection molding machine with no need to have other small parts, but if it's not articulated, you're in luck because you can just shoot out your non-articulated toy just like a bowl. But if your toy has moving parts or it's made up of different parts, well, then it's going to be more likely to have a sprue on it, which are those little doohickeys and tabs you sometimes see on toys, which connected it to the other parts that came out in the same plastic injection molding run. So these two army men are attached to a sprue, and they have to be disconnected from that sprue in order to be sold to the public. For example, this sprue here has all the parts needed to make up a toy car, and they would all have to be removed from the sprue and assembled by hand. That's one of the reasons toys are so expensive, because there's a lot of assembly, and it still has to be painted. All right, so that's the basis of how a toy is made when it comes to molding and it comes to tooling. Why toy molds are called tools, I'm not quite sure. I'm sure somebody knows out there, but that's what the industry calls them. What can I say? All right. Now, the question that I get a ton is, what if? Not, you know, what if Spider-Man hunted zombies, but what if a company wanted to produce a toy that's already been made? As an example, commemorative figures, and that's a perfect example of this. So, you have an old toy like, oh, I don't know, say, He-Man, right? You've heard of him? And you want to take the old He-Man toy and put out a commemorative version that looks, smells, 
tastes just like I don't suggest you taste He-Man. That's terrible. But the point is you want it to look like the original. You might do something different with the packaging to make it look commemorative, like these toys from Toys R Us from about, what, 1999 or more modern version, these retro collection Star Wars figures from Hasbro slash Kenner in the original packaging, but just with a giant red sticker that comes to the annoyance of all of us who want to hang them on our wall and not have it remind us that it's a recreation. But the point is, these toys are recreations of older toys, of existing toys. They're not made off of a new sculpt. Now, I'm not talking about something like this or, you know, Funko's reaction line where it's a modern toy line or property made to look like an old line. Those are all new sculpts. I'm talking about, like, the retro collection or those He-Man commemorative figures for the Toys R Us line where you are having an old one remade. And Star Wars fans love to compare versions, right? I mean, this happens a ton with the movies because, well, whether it's Disney or George Lucas, they're always tinkering with the movies and making them better. And, you know, McClunky aside, at least it gives us a chance to look at the way different versions can compare and contrast, right? We all remember English class and literature when we would do that. Well, now you can do that with Star Wars movies until the cow comes home or the uh, gerba comes home. And while this could be fun and can be painful at times, well, comparing and contrasting is something Star Wars fans are used to, so it's no wonder that they also do this with action figures when a recreation is presented to us. All right, so I've grabbed some images from JediBusiness.com, great website, and thank you for uh, letting me swipe your images from a Google search. Here are three different Lukes that were produced over three different decades, and you can see they're not quite the same. Same thing with Chewbacca here. There are differences, and Star Wars fans, as I said, will spend hours and hours and hours picking out the tiny details, whether it's paint ops, the size of the eyes, the pocket details, the paint ops. But when you look at the new one compared to the old one, well, most people kind of think that... Oh, that boy ain't right. And that's because what you're looking at is a copy of a copy. Right? You remember the old movie uh, Multiplicity? I mean, heck, I'm a sucker for any movie with Andy McDowell. I mean, you know, just go watch Hudson Hawk, okay? It's the greatest movie ever made. But the point being is in Multiplicity, you were dealing with the concept of clones that were copying each other, a copy of a copy of a copy, and as you got deeper into each copy, you saw less details. Now, we know everything out there really is just a copy of something else, and there's only so many stories. But when you're dealing with a toy and you're dealing with a reissue, this comes into play. So let's look back at Masters of the Universe Classics, a line I worked on. When you saw these toys at a convention, New York Toy Fair, New York Comic Con, you were usually looking at prototypes. You were not looking at actual plastic toys. Some of them, the ones that might be coming sooner, would be. And this is where scale comes into play, because the proportions of a prototype and the proportions of a figure are not one-to-one, -one, and that's going to come into play in a moment. So let me explain. And I'm going to use Mighty Spectre, not just because I created him, but as the obsessive compulsive I am, I have a lot of different uh, early versions of him that I was able to get signed out and or gifted by different folks, which we'll explain in a moment. So Mighty Spectre is shown at New York Toy Fair, or maybe it was Comic-Con. You can see he was quite purple, and I was really happy with this. But when he went into final production, the purple didn't quite come out as popping, shall we say, as I would have liked. Obviously, I wasn't going to complain that much. I mean, I was getting an action figure I designed from my childhood made in the He-Man line. That was a dream come true. So why am I going to, you know, start kicking up sand? But you can see there is a difference between the prototype and the final toy. And this can be in terms of the way the plastic works and deco, again. Here's the original version. You can see he had much brighter purple, which is what I intended. But again, I'm not going to cry about this because I'm still so excited to have this figure. He's sitting right here on my desk. All right. Now, I don't own that version because that version is owned by Mattel. It's in the bowels of Mattel with every other prototype. And I do not steal. Stealing is wrong, in, except for, you know, when it's right. But the point being is Mattel has all the prototypes. However... I am fortunate enough that while I don't have a prototype of Mighty Spectre, see, I was getting to this, I was given a really cool gift by the uh, Four Horsemen who worked on the line because, well, we had a great relationship and every year we were, you know, 
working tightly together. And they gave me a mighty specter that they hand painted, uh, making him like a bronze statue. And I treasure this every day. It's in my glass china cabinet. Well, my wife's cabinet. And she's like, yeah, why are there action figures in my china cabinet, Scott? The point being, though, is this is not an action figure. This is a prototype. It's done the same way as that purple one from New York Toy Fair. So you can see the pegs that were used to hold it together. It's not articulated. It's just resin held together by pegs. You can't pose the figure. You can't articulate it. It's basically a statue. But this is what's used to make the action figure. And a lot of people, when they see these in the case, don't realize what they're looking at is a statue held together by pegs. All right, so I've got a production Mighty Spectre on the left. Now you'll notice the um, statue is on a base, so I'm just going to take the production figure and stick him on the base so I can illustrate this point. It's not as easy to show, but I took a couple different shots here, some different angles, and you can see if I put them back to back, the production figure is taller and wider than the prototype. It, the proportions are a little bit bigger. You can see it here in a wider shot back to back. And this is exactly the point. When a toy mold is made based on a sculpt, the figure is going to get a little bit bigger. I know, I know. Get to the point. Get to the point. I'm trying to show you that. So when you have a retro figure that is a recreation of a figure from our childhood or 20, 30 years ago, they're not basing it off of a sculpt the way all the Motu Classics figures or, you know, modern Star Wars figures are. They're basing it off of an actual vintage figure which is then scanned usually by a laser, and that scan, that 3D scan, is used to make the retro toy, or the commemorative toy, whatever you want to call it. The same thing was done with Gentle Giant when they made their 12-inch figures, like Yak Face here, who still cracks me up that this is the only Yak Face I own, but that's what they do. It's a scan. In this case, they just enlarge the scan to make a larger figure, but they've scanned the original. And when this happens, you are going to get some washout, some loss of detail, because it's hard to make an exact copy. Now, you could re-sculpt the figure from scratch, but then you have to be super on model, and you have to be exact if collectors are going to be happy. And if the toy comes out off model, I mean, come on, we're adult collectors. We're going to notice that right away. So re-sculpting a vintage figure, an older figure, isn't the greatest idea because it's not really going to match. It's much, you're going to get a more accurate version by scanning a toy. So you'll take an old Battle Cat here, and you'll scan it, and ideally you'll get a one-to-one, -one, but it's not going to be quite that because you're now using an actual toy to recreate a toy. So the scale, the detail is going to be a little off. You'll use your laser, and it's going to pick up all of the fine details, but it's not going to be 100%. And that's why commemorative toys don't quite look like the original, is because they're making the new tool based on the original toy. Hey, that's just the cost of being popular and being popular enough to have your toy reissued, that it's not going to be perfect. But that's why it is, because it's not based on a sculpt, it's based on a scan. And that is how commemorative and retro action figures are tooled. I hope this video clarified that common question. Check out lots of videos on this channel. We have hundreds of them on toys. Search it. Go through it. Share it. Like it. Subscribe to it. It's always appreciated. Thanks for watching, and I'll see you next time.